Chapter 1. The Interview Have you ever thought about what causes a train wreck? All man-made large-scale disasters have one thing in common, one singular thread that connects the sequence of events, one event that, if avoided, would prevent the entire accident from ever occurring. There is always that one decisive moment before every single disaster. There is always that one moment where someone had to make a decision. There is always that one moment that started it all. There is always that one moment that ultimately led to the disaster occurring. For me, I was starting to think that moment in my life was going to be the moment I met Bill Montrosian. It's funny how opportunities in life kind of just spring up on you unexpectedly. For me, meeting Bill Montrosian was an opportunity of a lifetime. When most people go to bed, they dream of all sorts of things. When I go to bed, I dream of one thing. I dream of being rich. Go ahead and call it a lifelong obsession. Go ahead and call it greed. Go ahead and call it ambition. Go ahead and call it whatever you want. Because for me, I call it my dream. I didn't have grand ideals. I didn't want to save the whales. I just wanted to be filthy, stinking rich. This was an opportunity for me to start my career off on the right footing. It was Monday morning, and I found myself sitting in the lobby of a small insurance agency. Mind you, at the age of 22, my experience with insurance agencies was rather limited. My experience with insurance was limited to overhearing my parents bicker at the dinner table. Believe it or not, at this point in my life, I can't say that I've ever even stepped into an agency before. The agency was located smack dab in the middle of the exotic and luxurious West San Fernando Valley. Tap, tap, tap. If it weren't for the loud thuds that followed my dress shoes, I probably wouldn't have even noticed the noise. I tapped my feet, nervously waiting for the inevitability of those five words that typically prompted every interview. Mike, he'll see you now. Monday was turning out to be just like any other typical Monday in the SFV. It was ten minutes past nine a.m., and the thermometer inside the lobby was approaching a hundred and ten degrees. Part of the charm of living in the SFV was waking up to the very familiar aroma of heat melting asphalt. It was an acquired odor that only the locals could appreciate. To offset my nervousness, I perused the various magazines scattered around the lobby, the kind of obligatory browsing that goes on in lobbies as people wait for an appointment. I couldn't help but be a little anxious. This would be my first interview as a postgrad. In fact, this would be my first real job, and I didn't want to screw it up before it even began. I found myself looking down at my watch every thirty seconds or so. Aside from my normal neuroticism, I guess I thought by constantly looking down it would somehow make the time go faster. I showed up about fifteen minutes early to the interview. Showing up early was one of my trademarks. People either appreciated that or hated it. Early is on time, and on time is late, as my grandfather always used to say. I walked around the parking lot trying to convince myself not to back out. I think part of me was afraid. Mostly I was afraid that I'd end up being successful and not know how to handle it. The walking helped bring me back down to reality. I mean, I had to get the job first. See, for the last four years I'd been waiting tables to pay my way through an overpriced private college education. As luck would have it, waiting tables is how I landed this interview in the first place. At this point of time in my life I had only known one thing, and that was being a server. For the past three years I waited tables at an upscale steakhouse in the San Fernando Valley. It wasn't glamorous, but it paid the bills. About two weeks ago, a group of businessmen walked in and sat down at a booth in my section. Through some minor observations and cross-selling, I was able to impress them. Tools of the trade for someone who earned a living based on the generosity of others. It was abundantly clear to me that none of the men worked for a living. They had the telltale signs of high privilege and high society. The mirror-like polish on their dress shoes gave it away. Shoes don't tend to get scuffed unless you find yourself pounding the pavement. In my mind, that immediately ruled them out of being road warriors, which meant that, most likely, they sat behind a desk all day making the big bucks. 
Part of me envied that about those guys, you know, the good life. Turns out one of them ran a local insurance agency here in the valley. I'm a people pleaser by nature, and that fateful night was no different. My goal wasn't to get a big tip. I played the long game. I looked at this gig as my ticket to the big leagues. My goal was to leave such a good impression that I wanted the guests to think, man, I gotta hire that kid. Throughout the course of the evening, I began to strike up some conversation. It started off with some rather innocuous, table-side conversation. You know how it goes, the monotonous kind of small talk you would expect from an upscale restaurant server. As the night progressed, and more importantly, the drinks refreshed, one of the patrons took the bait and asked me how a sharp kid like me ended up waiting tables. I explained my situation, which was to say that, at the moment, I was vetting my options prior to graduating. I was interviewing with some of the most notable names in high finance, banking, etc. Now, did they have to know that I struck out at every firm in town? Heck no. Okay, so maybe I was bluffing a bit. What did I have to lose? It was always a dream of mine to go into the world of finance. Who wouldn't want to be in the world of finance? Who wouldn't want to make a six-figure payday? Who wouldn't want their own slice of the American dream? You get your name on a parking spot, a secretary, and even a corner office with your own private bathroom. The only thing more exciting to me than gambling was gambling with other people's money. I had to say that I was rather infatuated with the idea of success, and success looked like a pinstriped suit with a corner office. Turns out this guy ran one of the most lucrative and successful insurance practices in the San Fernando Valley, self-proclaimed, of course. I was intrigued, and he knew that my interest was piqued. I might as well have had a bumper sticker on my forehead that read, Desperate Broke College Student. At the very least, he was decent enough to invite a follow-up meeting. So he left me his business card and said, Call me. And that's how I met Bill Montrosian. I took his business card and placed it in the stack of cards that I'd been collecting for the last six months. I didn't want to call him the next day and make it abundantly clear I was desperate to find a job. The truth of the matter was, even though I had been working full-time to pay off school, I may have accumulated a small amount of student loan debt. I racked up somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000 or so in student loan debt. After six grueling months of attending job fairs, networking, and interviewing, I found myself with one viable option on the table. I found myself here, in a rundown strip mall, staring at a doorknob, waiting for someone to open it. My anxiety was at a peak state. Mind you, it wasn't interviewing that gave me anxiety. Not at all. Interviewing is easy. Anyone can fake being competent for 15 to 20 minutes. It wasn't even waiting for the interview that gave me anxiety. What gave me anxiety was the idea of being successful. Success wasn't just a goal in life. Success was everything to me. Success was part of my identity. The waiting room was quiet and small, not much bigger than a prison cell. What was behind that door? What waited for me beyond that door? I thought to myself as I stared at the door. Somehow I thought aimlessly staring into the abyss of the door would produce some kind of magical insight. Just as I began to space out, the phone rang at the receptionist's desk. Ring, ring, ring. At the same time, the receptionist was equally entranced on her cell phone lost down an endless rabbit hole of swipes and clicks, slipping away into the endless void of social media. The ringing barely phased her at all. She was staring down at her lap where she kept her phone. I imagine that's how she spent the better part of her day. She woke from her trance and jolted up from her phone. She sprang into action and answered the phone. Yeah, boss, she asked in an uninterested tone. Uh-huh she responded. I turned to her with my eyebrows raised in anticipation. I hadn't even realized it, but I rose out of my chair while staring at the door. Sweat dripped down my hands. I quickly wiped them off on my pants and hid them behind my back. He's sitting here in the lobby. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh, she said while hanging up the receiver. The receptionist looked over at me and calmly said, Mike, he'll see you now. 
just the five magical words I'd been waiting for. Butterflies swarmed my stomach with the prospect of landing this job. The receptionist flashed me a big smile and went back to trolling on her cell phone. Seconds later, the door swung open, and this giant of a man stuck his head through the doorway. It was just the man I was waiting for. It was Bill. He smiled and said, Mike, nice to see you again. As soon as Bill opened the door, he was followed by a flurry of noise on the sales floor. The sales floor was a bustle of activity. The phones were ringing off the hook. People were clamoring on as if it were the last day on earth. Great seeing you, I replied sheepishly. Before I could finish my response, he interrupted and said, Right this way, Mike. He held the door open with his left hand and motioned me over to enter with his right. As I walked through the door, I was hit with the aroma of four decades of scarcely washed commercial carpet. I walked through the door and began following Bill to his private corner office. As we walked back, I was stunned by the condition of the sales floor. To be kind, it was far from what I had envisioned in my mind. What was I signing up for? I asked myself. On the journey through the sales floor, we traversed past about a dozen or so bedraggled salespeople. The sales floor was dimly lit. Aside from the occasional desk lamp, most of the room was supported by the resplendent glow of the computer monitors sparsely scattered around the sales floor. As we passed each desk, I noticed that they were covered with sticky notes and mounds of paperwork. These desks were mostly held together with particle board, wads of duct tape, and hope. As we passed the salespeople, there were about another dozen or so empty desks leading up to Bill's office door. There were about another dozen or so empty desks leading up to Bill's office door. The desks looked barren, nothing but disconnected phones, scraps of paper, and seemingly wasted potential. It was like the elephant boneyard of former salespeople. What caught my eye immediately were the oversized, almost gag-gift-sized whiteboards situated behind each desk. We were walking too fast for me to make any sense of the whiteboards, but I assume it was for tracking leads or sales. What really struck my eye was the jumbo, old-fashioned sea captain's bell next to his office door. The bell was mounted on the wall between Bill's office door and the break room. As we approached the back of the sales floor, there was Bill's office, a substantial private office, and on the door it read, The Boss, in a big, bold letterhead. I was following Bill, more like acting as a shadow. He must have been six feet four or six feet five, easy. If I were to guess, he probably weighed in around 300 pounds. Bill opened the door and said, Come on in and take a seat. Thanks, I said. As I entered his corner office, I was a little taken aback. Bill's office was a throwback, an homage to the 1980s. It was like the land time had forgotten. The walls were covered with family photos, awards, and almost endless insurance degrees. The walls were lined with 30-year-old wood paneling, black marble floors, and forest green wallpaper. I started scoping out the room for some icebreakers. There's a lot for me to work with in here. I mean, maybe I could brush up some small talk by noticing one or two of the jazzy trophies in the trophy case. I always thought that the best salespeople are kind of like detectives. They have to notice things other people don't and use deductive reasoning to connect the dots. What stuck out to me the most was the fact that Bill had all these old movie posters on the wall. Scarface, The Godfather, Goodfellas, etc. After standing in the middle of his office, I quickly grabbed a seat and sat down. I already made a good impression at the restaurant. Just hear him out and hope for the best, I thought to myself. As I sat down, the chair wobbled to the right. I had to brace myself by grabbing the armrest. When Bill sat down, it was more of a crashing thud rather than a delicate placement. I could tell Bill was probably somewhat of a brute. He carried himself more like an ex-Navy SEAL rather than an insurance agent. As he got situated in his seat, he immediately started looking at one of his computer monitors. Bill slowly rolled up his sleeves and started vigorously clicking on his mouse and pounding on his keyboard. 
I did a little double take. I was expecting more of a captive audience for an interview. I just need to finish this up really quick. Give me a second or two, he said dismissively. He typed a couple of words and clicked a few buttons. I can tell that he was probably faking work to look important. Okay, all done, he said. It's not like he gave me much of a choice. I think he was feeling me out to see how desperate I really was. Maybe he was trying to establish his perceived level of superiority. Or maybe he just had some work to finish up. Either way, I was probably reading into the situation a little too much. Luckily for me, I came prepared. I made sure to do extensive research on his company. I looked at online reviews, job boards, hiring sites, consumer sites, and anything I could get my eyes on. Even after that level of preparation, nothing could have prepared me for what was about to come next. Bill clasped his fingers and looked over at me with a subtle intensity. He leaned forward in his chair, and what he said next I will never forget. Let's say you're meeting with a client at their kitchen table. Our typical client is in their mid to late 50s, owns a house, and has 2.5 kids. Odds are one of those kids is probably right around your age. What is some kid right out of college going to tell me about life insurance? What are you, Mike Allen, supposed to tell that client of any possible value? You're going to come into my house and tell me exactly... You're practically just coming out of wearing diapers. What are you going to tell someone like that? Why should they listen to you? Why should they give you the time of day? What are you going to say that prevents them from just slamming the door right in your face? Bill sat back in his chair with the most self-congratulatory smirk I've ever seen. Clearly, he had practiced this speech before. Obviously, he was thinking that I'd be stumped by his line of questioning. In all fairness to Bill, I was genuinely stumped. I've been on dozens of interviews at this point, but nothing compared to this one. I took a deep breath and leaned forward in my chair. What's stopping the client from protecting his family? I asked. Bill appeared irked by my answer. I wasn't quite sure how to take it. I mean... Was that a good thing or a bad thing? You're serious. That's your answer. You're going to walk into someone's home and tell them they don't care about their family. That's what you're going with? He asked. His tone noticeably shifted down. I figured he was stalling for time. It was clear to me that most people Bill interviewed probably stumbled their way through his question. I decided to press forward. It was becoming more obvious that this was unusual territory for Bill. Bill was selling insurance long before I was born, a fact I was trying to be well aware of during our interview. Well, Bill, I said in an irreverent tone. Bill crossed his legs and adjusted his lapel. He ever so slightly smirked, which was laced with a hint of gotcha. Is that a picture of you in Italy? I asked with an inquisitive and inviting tone. I sheepishly pointed over to a photograph behind his shoulder. Bill turned his head and said, It is. Ah, I've never been. Is it nice? I asked. Let's put it this way. We like it so much that we spend two weeks of every year over there, he said. Well, Bill, I guess I just have one question, I said while scratching my head. Bill started tapping his fingers on his desk, who was becoming increasingly fed up with me stalling to answer his question. It seems like you enjoy traveling to exotic places, and based on your trophy collection, spend a considerable amount of time on golf courses. What's getting in your way from protecting your family with life insurance? I asked in a cagey tone. My strategy was rather simple in theory. I probably wasn't going to win this battle, but that didn't mean Bill had to win either. He raised his eyebrows and clasped his hands together. Bill was noticeably perturbed and decided to take some time to mull over his response. He shook his head and unpredictably surrendered. Okay, I'm impressed. You're more clever than you look, my gallon. I give you that. But that sure doesn't mean you can sell life insurance. Life insurance isn't something you just go around and buy like a sandwich or shampoo. You don't just go to the store and buy it. 
Bill paused again, but this time it was a longer, more intentional pause. Do you understand what I'm trying to get at, Mike? I think so, I responded. Mike, everyone who walks through that door has enthusiasm and thinks enthusiasm alone entitles them to sell insurance. That somehow passing an exam gives them the right to sell insurance. As if somehow just getting an insurance license and having a good attitude was enough to make it in this industry. At this point, Bill was monopolizing the entire conversation, and I dare say starting to project a bit. It was clear by the wall of sales trophies and accolades that Bill had a distinguished track record. It was clear this was the horse to park my wagon behind. It was clear I had no clue what I was getting myself into. Do you understand? Get what I'm saying? I understand, I said, followed by a welcoming nod of acknowledgement. I couldn't help but just shake my head in agreement, like a trained seal waiting for someone to throw him a fresh fish. Bill asked in a deflecting and slightly dismissive tone, Why should I hire you? I've always found it annoying to answer a question with a question, but found it useful during interviews. That's a good question. Let me ask you something, Bill. What would you say got me to this point? Why am I sitting here? You're quick on your feet. You're good with numbers and good with people. Those aren't easy qualities to find in someone from your generation. Bill developed large overlapping circles of sweat under his armpits. I wouldn't have noticed it, but he kept stretching his arms in the air. What kind of people tend to succeed in this position? Bill shot me this little grin and readjusted himself in his chair. He faintly started swaying back and forth in his all-black executive leather chair. What kind of people? People who tend to succeed in this position are people who don't bother me. People who tend to succeed in this position are people who don't give up. People who tend to succeed in this position learn to get things done. I hire people assuming that they know what they're doing. I nodded my head in agreement. I've always followed a pretty simple rule for success in sales and in life. Open my mouth half as much as I listen. Bill paused and waited for me to say something. What do you think this is? What do you think we're doing here? What an odd question to ask someone during an interview. I wasn't really sure how to answer something like that. I was in uncharted waters and decided to proceed with a healthy amount of trepidation. This is all part of your selection process, isn't it? Honestly, I was a bit confused by the question. What was I supposed to say? No, 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 Mike. This is the de-selection process. This is the part of the process I use to weed out all of the qualified yet destined to fail candidates. This is where I thin out the herd he said, while making quotation marks with his fingers. Hmm. I was still grappling with this question. I get a lot of people with fancy college degrees, obnoxiously high grade point averages, internships from Fortune 500 companies, and all sorts of active collegiate experience. I get a lot of people that on paper are better than you. Oh, Bill was certainly expeditious with his critiques and generous with sharing his opinions. There are two ways to pull off a Band-Aid, fast or slow. Clearly, Bill's preference was to rip it off as fast as possible. But, and there is a but to that proclamation, what I've found from my years of experience is that none of that stuff means anything in the real world. What matters in sales, particularly in life insurance sales, are the intangibles, things you cannot measure easily, the things that tell me who you are as a person. The intangibles? That's right. Bill took a brief pause to drink some coffee out of what seemed to be a late 90s porcelain coffee mug. He clutched that coffee mug, almost like a boa constrictor latching onto an elk, Bill started this annoyingly loud slurp at the end of his sips. I wasn't really sure what to say, so I started looking around the room. He had half-empty coffee mugs littered all across his office. As he slowly lifted the cup, I noticed he had three distinctive gold rings on. His right hand was adorned by a class ring, along with a pinky ring and a wedding band. 
Bill slowly finished drinking his coffee and said, Numbers on a spreadsheet are just that. Numbers. Data is just data. Any corporate moron can read a report and regurgitate the numbers on it. Ultimately, all that data stuff is completely meaningless without knowing the intangibles. Bill commenced drinking his coffee a lot like he spoke, very meticulously and deliberately. Does that make sense? he asked. It does, I replied in a dastardly tone of voice. In all reality, I had no clue what he was talking about. I was trying to retain my composure, but didn't have the slightest clue what he was talking about. What I'd like to know, Mike, is... What I'd really like to know from you is simple. He slammed down the coffee mug on his desk. Bill started looking for something. I couldn't tell what. His inquisition completely hindered the conversation. I noticed he didn't have a coaster under his mug, so I started looking around for one. There was a stack of them hidden under a ream of papers on the corner of Bill's desk. I carefully sifted through the paper and grabbed one of the coasters. I dusted it off a bit and handed it to Bill. Thanks, kid. You're all right. No problem. Like I was saying... Wait, what was I saying? You wanted to know something about me. Ah, yeah. What do you think your biggest weakness is? My... my biggest weakness? I can't say that I had ever given that question a lot of thought before. Bill went back to drinking his coffee, so I took some time to think about it. One thing I hated was not having the answer right on the top of my head. Being quick-witted always seemed to be my meal ticket in life. Naturally, I blurted out the first thing that popped into my head. My greatest weakness is that I don't have much of a dimmer switch. I've got an on switch and an off switch. Retrospectively, that sounded a lot better in my head. Yeah, I kind of picked up on that. Bill chuckled a bit and slowly put down his coffee mug. He grabbed the top of the mug with his fingers and spun the mug around. Okay, so here's the process in a nutshell. You're going to go and get licensed. That way I know you're serious about working here. A license by itself has almost nothing to do with selling insurance, he said. Over the next few months I'd come to find out just how true that was. Sounds easy enough. I mean, it's just insurance. It's not like we're talking about chemical engineering. Don't get too cocky, kid. Bill shook his head at me. I think he saw a lot of me in him. I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. At least I had something going for me. At that point, if you get licensed, you can apply for the open position. Go on the website and apply like everyone else. If you can do all of that, then you're going to have to compete for the job. Obviously, the sooner you get licensed, the better chances you have of getting the job. We're looking to hire someone within the next 30 to 45 days. Bill extended his fingers and started spinning the brim of his coffee mug. He twirled the mug for a few seconds. I wasn't sure if it was a nervous tick or just his way of killing time. Just so you know, we've posted this position on your university's job board. So the people, you might even know the other candidates. Bill put down his coffee mug and started checking his gold-plated wristwatch. Assuming I get past the other candidates, so uh, what then? Great question. I like that you're thinking long term, but you're getting way too far ahead of yourself. Once you've done that, then you'll need to take an online sales test. A sales test? Don't worry, it's probably not nearly as bad as you think. Plan on it being much, much, much worse. Bill started waning in and out of his dry humor. Bill had a certain way of making you feel right at home when he spoke. I mean, aside from the sinister overtones and the gaudy jewelry. The test is going to be approximately 200 questions. You'll have up to three hours to complete it. The test is mostly a combination of word, logic, and math problems. Okay, that's it. If I never hear from you again, great. But if I do hear back from you, I'll know. I'll know that you're serious about making something out of your life. Bill stood up abruptly out of his chair. He towered over me from behind his desk. He offered his hand to me. 
We shook hands, and he rushed me out of his office. That was it. That was my first interview.